Hey, is there any coding involved in opening a Cobras? I mean, yes, sir. All right, how's everyone doing? Cool. Week five. Moving forward. All right, so I want to talk about a few announcements, um, some new postings on Canvas. I want to go through PA2, um, talk about another application of Stacks do a refresher on hashes, and then we're going to start talking about trees, which will be our topic for the next few weeks at least. Um, so any questions up front? Uh, you said like we weren't going to go crazy into how to like use hashes optimally in different situations. Right. Like that. Is that like a later class that does it? Or? Um, well, I'm not sure where you would encounter that. Yeah, a, a more advanced data structures class, you might spend a, more time looking at different kinds of hash functions or different ways to probe or things like that. Um, I don't know where exactly that would come up, though. But if you wanted to get really deep into it, it might be like more of a graduate level thing, maybe. Um, um, hash functions are... are it's kind of a, a general concept, right? This idea of taking something like a key and turning it into something like a number. Um, this pops up in, in password security, right? So, so one of the early rules of password security is you never store passwords on your system, right? Some places still do. A lot of places did until a few years ago. Um, and you should never do that because you can't assume that you have absolute security over your hard drives, right? Someone can break into your facility, steal the hard drives, and if there's a file called password that has the passwords in it, your passwords are compromised, right? So for, for a long time, best practice has been you don't store the actual password. So how do you authenticate if you don't have a copy of the passwords? How do you know if somebody's authorized to log into an account? So how do you use encryption to do that? Mm -hmm. But someone who knows the key can decipher it or decrypt it. Um, so yes, so that's that's one approach, um, assuming you believe in the security of that key. Okay, but you have a disgruntled employee who leaves, and they knew that key. They can put that out there, and then if so someone grabs that file, they can decrypt. So a version of that that's a little more secure is to use a one-way function. So, so picture a box, you put in a password, and you get out some kind of gibberish version of that password, or if you like, an integer, right? And you set this box up, the function in this box, in such a way that if you know this, you cannot go back to that. So it's, it's a one-way function. For example, if you take a bunch of letters and you add their ASCII codes together and you reduce modulo, you know, 1,007, you get some number over here. From that number, it's impossible to figure out what the collection of letters was. But for that particular hash function, it's easy to come up with a combination of letters that would hash to this. But if you make this function something very clever, so that in general you can't find an arbitrary collection of, of letters that'll map to this function, you have a one-way hash function. So the person says, I want to set my password to this. The system runs it through this function and it stores this hashed version of their password. Now when somebody wants to log in, they type in their password. What does the system do? Takes what they type, runs it through the same function, and compares the cryptid version to the cryptid version. So nobody ever has to be able to turn this back into a password, and the password is not stored, but unless they know the, crypt, the, the original password, what they type in is not going to encrypt to the same thing. Right? So it's basically what we do with hashes. You take a key, you, you turn it into an index, and then when you want to search for that key, we don't go through the set of, of 
indexes and try to find the key like that. We take the key you're looking for, map it into an index, and that should tell us where the key is stored. So it's, it's kind of a similar function. <clears throat> All right, so I posted a couple of extra credit opportunities on Canvas. Um, one is for a teaching demo which is going on Friday at 11 o'clock in 126. And if you want to go to that, we have candidates come in from time to time and they give teaching demos. It's good to have students in the audience. Yes? How long does it go? Um, less than an hour, I believe. Probably quite a bit less. So um, you come in, you listen to the talk, and you might ask questions. And then there's usually like a, a few question survey that we ask you to fill out at the end, just kind of giving your impressions, what were the strong points, and so on. Um, and it helps us, you know, in the process of trying to find people to, to teach courses. So that's something you're interested in anyway. Um, but you can also get extra credit. So um, for the teaching demo, I'll give you 50 points in the ODP section. So it's like half of an ODP for free. Um, the other opportunity is um, Mesa is working with Fort Vancouver High School and there's some students there who are doing some Arduino related projects and they need some a few volunteers to sort of help out and it's just basic you know Arduino level code hooking things up stuff like that um, if you want to do that there's a contact address for Nadia um, she's the person to talk to talk to her as soon as possible because the first session was today but I think they also need help next Monday um, and there's a variety of times listed. If Since you normally come to this class, if you want to come to the 11 o'clock class that day, you can do that, because I think the earliest <coughs> session is like 9.30 to 10.30. Um, so that would conflict. But that's 100 points of extra credit in the ODP section, so that's like an entire free ODP um, that you can get credit for. So, um, so either one of those. I may be locked out of Canvas. In which case. Life is over. <laughs> Life is not over. <laughs> We're back. All right, so those, those are posted um, <coughs> extra credit opportunities. Um, I've opened up a couple of more quizzes. So two quizzes that I would like you to do by um, by Wednesday and so quiz three and these are due at midnight so uh, quiz three is um, a linked list quiz so it's five questions I believe and it's just multiple choice um, and quiz four is a hash quiz sorry they're due at 5 p.m. not midnight um, so hashes. So these these are potential practice for um, for the midterm. I'm not going to have you coding things on stacks or queues um, or hashes for the midterm, but I may ask you conceptual questions, fill in the blank kind of things. So this will help with the hashes. Um, PA3 will help with stacks and queues. And linked list is a quiz, just because I should quiz you on linked list, because linked list will definitely be a prominent part of the midterm. Um, but that will also likely include include some coding. All right, so um, so I graded PA two. PA two looked fantastic. People did a really good job on this. Um, I've never had this many students showing this level of success at this point in the year. It's amazing. Um, so I'm really happy with that. Um, I think the average grade on PA two was like 95 or something. <laughs> So that's that's awesome. Um, if if you didn't figure out how to do PA two right, please 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 come talk to me because um, in most cases people who knew the alg people seem to know the algorithm right. And if you lost a lot of points, it was really kind of an implementation thing. And it's making this transition from implementing things using that that funny array system we were using to actually using the arrows right, dereferencing a pointer and picking up a field. And you really got to nail that down 
for everything we're going to do from here on out, which is talking about trees and then coding trees and PA4 and so on. Um, that's just going to be really important. And it's just learning the mechanics, right? I think people understand the I ideas of linked lists. They understand the issues of how to find where to insert something and, and not uh, getting tangled up with null pointers and stuff like that. Um, so it's just learning the mechanics. And it's just there's a few different ways you can think of this. And if you're thinking of it a slightly wrong way, then it can look like everything is just like crazy and not making sense, right? But it's, it's like a minor course correction, I think, to, to figure out exactly how to use these. So please come and talk to me. And, and I'm not regularly coming in at 8 o'clock. But if you want to talk to me and you can't make it for 9 o'clock hours, send me an email and I can arrange to meet you at 8 o'clock <coughs> on a Monday, Wednesday, or Friday. So, um, so take advantage of that. Are we going to have to know any of the weird algorithms for the uh, array linked list? Because now that you're, no. you're more moving on the Malik, so no. Yeah. yeah. Um, I mean, you should be able to, to cobble that together if you had to, but I'm not going to ask you about that specifically. Is your hand going up? Yeah. Yeah. OK. <laughs> So my, my weekly documented <coughs> version of, of PA2, um, it really doesn't differ from PA1 very much. My init returns a struct node star. Um, that's different, as, as I warned you in the struct node. Um, next field is a struct node star instead of an integer. That's different. And we need standard lib for doing malloc's. Um, the rest of this is very much the same, so the main program's not going to differ at all, except we call list equals init instead of um, just init list. The process function is the same for taking in an argument and deciding what, what command you're asking for and how to parse it, so all of that's, that's unchanged. That's the usage. That's unchanged. Um, the init function, right, call malloc, save the return value in a variable, um, set its next field to null and return. Um, and I should do a check right here and make sure return value is not null because if return value is null, this will seg fault because I'll try to dereference null, right? So if we run out of memory, this will seg fault here. Um, so I should do a check, but if I did a check, I would just return a null and I'd seg fault somewhere else. <coughs> um, so Add function, right? These things are, are struct node stars, which they kind of were before anyway, since they were integers. But um, list is the sentinel node, so I said previous equal to the list, current equal, and this is how we constantly get the next field. It's just pointer arrow next. The data field is pointer arrow data. So malloc a new node. If it's null, I do check that here. Fail. Um, Otherwise, set the data field equal to num. So now new is the new thing we're going to insert. And then you've seen this loop before. So while the current node is not null, compare its data to num. If it's bigger than the number we're inserting, um, have the previous node point to new, have the new node point to current and return. All right, so it's two lines to do the insert. Otherwise, our favorite two lines to move down the list. Previous becomes the current node, and current is whatever current's pointing to. If you get through all of that, you can do these same two lines to add to the end of the list. Take the previous node, which will be the last node of the list, point to the new node, have new point to null. And when you're trying to code this, right, again, don't try to memorize. Um, try to work through it. So here's previous, here's current. And let's say we're trying to insert something at the end of the list. So I'll compare 40 to current arrow data, right? So I'm looking at current. So current is the node I'm looking to see if I should insert before. And you want to fix whatever your definitions are in your brain. To me, current's the node I'm looking to see if I should insert before. 20 is not bigger than 40, so going to set previous to current, current to previous, 
current to current next. And now I'm going to compare current data to 40. It's not bigger, so I don't want to insert before here. So I'll set previous to current and current to current next, which is going to be null. And I can't compare current data to 40 anymore. Right, so that tells me I want to exit my loop when current is null. So that's where that came from. And when I exit, where do I want to insert? I want to take my new node and I want to put it after previous. <coughs> now if I had a different definition in my mind for what previous and current was, maybe I'd want to put it after current. Right, it depends how you're writing your code. The way I wrote it, Current is the node I'm looking for. When that's null, previous is the last node in the list, so I want to put it after previous. And that's what drives this line of code, previous next equals new. All right, and then deletes the same as usual if the current node's data is equal to the number we're deleting. Um, I go ahead and I skip over it. I set the previous to point to current next. Current is still pointing to that node that I'm removing from the list, so I can pass that to my free call. And that frees the node, and I can return right there. Otherwise, keep searching for your number. Search is just a subset of that. Move down the list. And then release was trying to release the entire linked list. So if you exit the program without deleting all your nodes with, with the delete command, right, you've got stuff left over in memory. So release takes a pointer to the sentinel node and it says free all the memory. So set pointer equal to the current node um, and free this is a temporary variable. So as long as pointer is not null, I save a pointer to it and free this. I move pointer to the next node, and then I free my free this node. So you're freeing like one step behind you. Take a step, free where you were. Take a step, free where you were. All right, you're picking up a trail of stones that you're stepping on. And when you get to the end, there's no stones left behind you. But that's all you're doing here. But you can't pick up the stone that you're on or the stone in front of you, because then you got nowhere to go. And then release is just used in the exit command before you exit. So any questions about this? Like I say, most people seem to have this down. Memory leaks were, were somewhat common. Um, is there a diff, like say we were looking at your void release function, mm -hmm. asterisk is there a difference whether you put the asterisk back to the node in the for list? Nope. No, okay. Yeah, the space is irrelevant. Okay, that, I was because I saw some stuff where it's like that, and then I kind of messed with it, but nothing really changed it. So I think you can actually say struct space node star list without a space anywhere between node and list. Okay. Um, but it's it's means the same thing. I have some reason why I do that, but I don't remember what it is. <laughs> I think it's oh, I noticed too, like if you put them. You say like struct and then you put multiple ones, you have to put that in front of the actual, like the, the variable list. Yeah. Because <coughs> I tried that where it's like struct node. Yeah, I don't think node star list. star would be valid. Um, <coughs> but I don't know. Well, I'll break this if I try it. Um. going to be upset that it's not prototyped, but that's okay. Yeah, it doesn't mind that. It seems to be okay with it. That would be an evil test question. <laughs> Give you something like that and then write some code for it. Not evil. <coughs> All right, something else I wanted to say about that. Um,
Yeah, it slipped my brain. So, so this is this is another version where um, I was doing one step look ahead. So, um, so in here I initialized pointer to be the sentinel node, and my loop is well pointer next is not null, right? So while my current node is pointing to something, I move to that something. Right, that becomes next pointer, and I compare that something's data, and the rest of this is kind of the same. And then I have to move a single pointer down the list at the bottom of my loop. And there's there's different approaches to this, right? Um, when you print, you can start off with your pointer being your sentinel node and see if it's pointing somewhere. If it is, move to that node, print out the data. All right, so here you'll see a pointer arrow next not equal to null in the while loop. So which one should you use, pointer or pointer arrow next? It depends, right? There's no hard and fast rule. This is why I keep saying things like don't memorize or don't just write down the sacred code, right? There is no sacred code. It's, it's knowing what you're doing, what your interpretation of these variables are, and writing code that makes sense based on that. And there's there's always different ways to do it, um, but once you can think about it like that, right? Then there's no code in the world that can stop you, right? All right, um, let's talk about stacks a little more. So I may have mentioned at the end of class Friday this idea of reverse Polish notation. Did I mention that in here? So um, A plus B <coughs> times C plus D. And when we write this algebraically, we know that we have to do A, B first, we have to do C plus D next, and then we have to multiply those. And in RPN, it's operand, operand, operator, okay? So RPN is also called postfix. And it's basically number, number, and then operation that you want to perform. So we would write this as saying, let's take A and B and add them. And then let's take C and D and add them. And then let's take the last two things we calculated and multiply them. And on these old Hewlett Packard calculators from the 70s, right, this is how you would actually do calculations. You type your number, hit enter, type your number, hit enter, and then you'd say add. You type a number, enter, a number, enter, add, and then multiply, and your number pops out. And it was great fun because nobody could borrow your calculator unless they had one themselves because it made no sense to anybody else. Um, it turns out if we have an expression like this, we can evaluate it using a stack. And it's really straightforward. So here's, here's an algorithm. Um, so if you have a number, push. If you have an operation, pop, pop, operate, and push. At the end of the string, your answer is at the top of the stack. So what does this look like? Here's a number A, so we're going to push this on our stack. So here's our stack. And as usual, I'll start writing things here, but I'll, I'll grow the stack in this direction. Right, so the top of the stack is always going to be on the bottom of the page. So there's a number, let's push it. There's our A. Here's another number B, let's push that. Here's an operator. So it says pop two things off, apply the operation, and push. So we pop off the B, 
we pop off the A, we apply the operation, A plus B, and we push that onto the stack. So now our stack has one thing on it, which is A plus B. There's another number C, so we push that on the stack. There's a number D, so we push that. There's another operator. So pop two things off the stack, that's a D and a C. Apply the operation, which is a plus, and push the result onto the stack. So we're going to push C plus D onto the stack. So our stack has two things on it now, A plus B and C plus D. Go to the next character in your input, that's a multiply, it's an operator. So pop two things off. Well, the first thing we're going to pop off is C plus D. The second thing is A plus B. We're going to apply the operation, right? So these are off the stack. And then we're going to push the results. So now our stack contains one thing, which is A plus B times C plus D. We're at the end of our input string, so there's no number, there's no operator, so our answer is at the top of the stack, and we pop that off. There's the result of evaluating our expression. And you can take any expression, and if you write it in RPN, you can evaluate it with just this three-step algorithm. And so a lot of times when you have a compiler or an interpreter or something that's trying to understand things like this, one of the first things you do is you turn it into something like that, which you can do with trees. And then once you have it written in RPN, it's a simple stack-based algorithm for evaluating it. So that's another kind of classic application of um, stacks. All right, so any questions up to here? Stacks, queues, hashes, lists, printf. Okay. So let's talk about trees. So trees are awesome. So remember when we started talking about linked lists, we were talking about order of complexity. And if we had an array of integers and it was sorted, we could search efficiently, but we couldn't insert into the middle of it without moving everything down. So we created a linked list so that these things could be placed anywhere in memory, these, these nodes that store our numbers, and we just have a pointer from each node to the next node in the list. Um, and that brings our insert and our delete times down to be order one, but it doesn't help us with search. With an array, if it's sorted, we can do high-low. We can do a binary search, start in the middle and keep subdividing. And in log n operations, we can find a number in an array of n numbers. But that broke down for our linked list because if you have a <coughs> list like this, and you're searching for a number, the only thing we know is where the first node in the list is. And you just got to follow and follow until you decide your number's not in the list or you find it. So if we wanted to do what we do with an array, right, and let's, let's review how we play high-low, right? You want to find a number, you start with a number in the middle of your array. And if that number is bigger than what you're looking for, we say, I don't have to search any of this half of the array. I only have to search this remaining half. And we just cut the size of our problem down by a factor of two. And so we can compare the number we're looking for to the middle of this array. And if that's smaller, then we only have to check in this quarter of the original array. And so each operation, we're cleaving the list in half. All right, so a million numbers, 20 operations, you've cut this down to a list of size one, an array of size one, and that takes one operation. To do this, the key is being able to start with a number in the middle of the array. So let's, let's make our linked list of numbers. Okay. 
And what we'd really like is some way of finding this number right in the middle. That's the first number we want to search and compare. So we're going to, instead of having a sentinel node here that points to the first node, we're going to have something that points to the middle node of our list. And so in one operation, we can find the number that's halfway between the smallest and the largest. And if we know that that number is smaller than what we're looking for, we don't have to deal with these numbers at all. We only have to check this half-sized list. So that's pretty good, right? We've cut our problem size in half. If we want to keep going, though, we need to know where the middle of this list is. Otherwise, we just start here and we're back to a linear search. So what we're going to do is we're going to store a pointer from here to the halfway point of this list. And we're also going to store a pointer from here to the halfway point of the smaller list. Well, we want to repeat this process. We want to know um, which side of this middle point should we be checking. So say that our number was bigger than 40, so that we follow a link and it brings us over to a 60. We're searching this smaller list. Is our number bigger or smaller than 60? If it's smaller than 60, we have to check the midpoint of this list over here on the left. It's just one node now, but that's okay. So we're going to store a pointer to the halfway point. And if our number was bigger than 60, we want to get to the halfway point on the right, so we'll store a pointer like that. And if we had found our number was smaller than 40, we would have come here to the 20, and we want a pair of pointers coming from there also. So this is what we're going to turn our list into, this kind of sea serpenty sort of, of squiggly collection of arrows, where each node is going to have two pointers coming off of it, not just one. One arrow will point to the midway point on the left, the other will point to the halfway point on the right. And instead of starting with a sentinel node, we're going to start with what we call the root. And the root's just going to be this node that's roughly halfway through the list. So let's say we want to find the number 45. We'll start at the root, we'll say 45 is bigger than that, let's follow the link to the right. Here's a 60, 45 is smaller than that, let's follow the link to the left. Here's a 50, 45 is smaller than that, let's follow a link to the left. And our links to the left are going to be null. And each of these, if there's nothing on the left, we'll just have them point to null. And that'll tell us basically we're at the end of that chain of nodes. And so 45 wasn't in here. But if you're looking for, say, 70, we'll start at the root 40. 70 is bigger. Let's go to the right. That's a 60. 70 is bigger. Let's go to the right. There's a 70. Hey, there's our number. And it took us three operations instead of 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. So this is a tree. It's a binary tree because we have two arrows coming off of each node. And if we keep this picture in mind, we can draw this a little differently. So for this particular set of data, here's our root. That's the number 40. It should have something on the left going to a 20, something on the right going to a 60. That 20 should have something on the left going to 10, something on the right going to 30. The 60 has a 50 on the left and a 70 on the right. So this is a binary tree. And it's actually what we're going to call a binary search tree. A binary tree, these nodes could be anything. A binary search tree, they satisfy this property of, of going from smallest to largest, so they're ordered. Could be largest to smallest, but we always do smallest to largest in here.
All right, so we're going to play with these for a few weeks in various forms. Um, let me show you some trees, some binary trees. Arbitrary binary search tree. And it's much easier to draw it like this than to draw it as a list with arrows going off to the other sides. Because like this, it's pretty easy to see what's going on, um, which is the following. For example, if we look at the 40, this is the root of the tree, right? So it's a tree that's growing down from the sky. This is the root. Everything to the left of the root is smaller than the root. And everything to the right is bigger. And you can have the same number twice in your tree, but I'm usually going to not do that because it makes statements like what I just made kind of imprecise. So I'm going to assume numbers are only stored in here once, but that's not like a, a fundamental requirement. Um, Every point in this tree is the root of another tree, right? And if you've ever pruned a tree or, or explored a tree, you're familiar with this, right? Every branch is kind of like the trunk of another little tree. It's got branches coming off of it and so on and so forth. Um, this is the root of another tree. It's got 55 on the left and it's got all this stuff on the right. And again, everything to the left is smaller. Everything to the right is bigger than the root. This is also the root of a tree. And everything to the left is smaller than three. Everything to the right is bigger than three. It's a binary search tree, so we're not allowed, for example, to have a third node coming off of one of these. Non-binary trees, not a problem. And you can have a hundred things coming off of each node, um, and that's fine. But for a binary tree, there's always two nodes. Where those nodes might be null, right? For example, on the left of the 20 is this 10. On the right of 20 is null. And we don't usually draw the null pointers. We just leave them blank. So by that notion, this is also a binary search tree. Its root is 100, and it has nothing on the left or on the right. And that's fine. All right, so some terminology that we'll start throwing around. Um, there's the root, which is that topmost node. OK, there's children. So if this is a root, these are the children. There's the notion of a parent. So if we look at this node, its parent is the node above it. So kind of like an ancestry tree. So here's a parent, here's a child. We'll talk about left and right. So this is the left child of the parent. This is the right child of the parent. Yeah? Does the root only ever refer to the very first one? Or do you kind of refer to other, like, <coughs> like could the root and the parent be the same thing? Or is it only ever just the first? Um, so for this lot. tree, this is the root. Okay. But for this subtree, this is the root of that subtree, right? And so every, every node is the root of some tree. So every node has potentially two children. If you consider a null child to be a child, then every node has two children. Um, but if you don't, then it might have one, it might have none. Every node has exactly one parent. 
Okay, we don't allow a situation like this. Right, where this node has two parents, that's not a valid binary search tree. Okay, so that's not allowed. And we don't allow cycles like that. Right, because again, this node would have two parents. So a parent has zero, one, or two children. Every child has to have a parent. We can talk about leaf nodes, or leaves. So what's a leaf? It's a node with no children. Right, it's like a leaf on a tree. There's no branch coming out of it, leading to other trees. So where are the leaves in this tree? Right there, 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 and there. have a tree like this. We can talk about the depth of a node. And that's the number of steps from the root the node. So here's the root. So how many steps do we have to follow to get from the root to this node? Exactly one. Just come along the link. So the depth of this node would be one. And similarly to get from the root to this node, the depth would be one. But to get to this node down here, this leaf node, we have to go through one, two steps, so this has a depth of two. And guess what? The way I've drawn this, every node at this depth is going to have a depth of two. But this node right here, you have to go through one, two, three. That has a depth of three. These have a depth of four. This has a depth of five. Sorry, yeah. All right, so one, two, three, four, five. So what would the depth of the root be, do you think? Zero. Because we have to take no steps to get from the root to the root. All right, so the depth of a node is the number of steps from the root to the given node. We can talk about the height of a tree. is the maximum of all depths. So find the depth of every single node, whatever the largest depth is, that's the height of the tree. So what's the height of this tree? Five, right? So height equals five. What about a node that is just a root and doesn't have anything else in it? What's the height of that tree? That's zero. Because the depth of this node is zero, and that's the only depth. So the height is zero. All right, so here's the weird one. What about a null tree? What about a tree that has absolutely no nodes to it, doesn't even have a root? If we really wanted to know its height, what might you guess? Null empty, it's gotta be an integer. Negative one. That's exactly what we're going to do. 
and it doesn't make any sense. There's no, there's no intuitive reason why a height of minus one corresponds to a null tree, but it makes everything work really nicely, and that's enough reason. <coughs> All right, so when we talk about functions for calculating height and depth, we'll come back to this and, and it'll make you smile the way it works. Um, all right, so that's, um, that's height and depth. Well, why do we care about any of this? What are we gonna do with trees? probably see me draw this tree a bunch of times in the next few days. Um, that's a binary search tree. We know it's a binary search tree because at each node, everything to the left is smaller, everything to the right is larger. If this number here was a 15 instead of a 30, it's no longer a binary search tree because 15 is not bigger than 20. It should be on the left. But like this, it's a good binary search tree. Well, it turns out that if we traverse this tree in the right way, remember traversing a data structure just means somehow going through and finding everything that's in the structure. If we traverse this tree in the right way, we will get our numbers in order, increasing order or decreasing order, depending on how we traverse. <coughs> It also turns out that if we do this A plus B times C plus D, if we try to store this in a tree as follows, right, this is just symbolically. This is saying take A and B and add them, take C and D and add them, and then take those two things and multiply them. If we take our incoming expression, we can turn it into a tree like this. And if we traverse this tree in a different way, what we'll actually get is this. We'll get the RPN version of our original expression. And this is how we can evaluate algebraic expressions. Take your expression, turn it into a tree, and then do a certain kind of traversal, a certain order, and out pops the RPN. Right? A different order, if this is a binary search tree, they come out in increasing or decreasing order. This is obviously not a binary search tree because I don't know if B is greater than or less than plus. Right? It's not a meaningful statement. It's just a binary tree. Um, so traversal of trees will be our next topic, and we'll start on that tomorrow. And um, we'll see a few different ways to traverse a search tree like this to pull our data out. Um, and that'll launch us down the path to doing some recursive programming. <coughs>